Okay, good morning everyone. I hope you are all doing well. Uh, it's truly a joy to see that many of us have been, you know, praying for each other and to see the amazing results where God has been answering prayers. And uh, I just pray that we'll con let's continue to keep praying for one another and all the people who have been sick. So we will continue our journey in the book of Matthew. I hope you're enjoying just learning about Jesus from the book of Matthew. And if you remember last time in the book of Matthew chapter 15, when we saw that the kingdom of God is not limited to only the Jews, but it was also open to the Gentiles. And I left with three questions for you to think about. And number one was, like the Canaanite woman, are we willing to come to Jesus on his term and condition and surrender our life to him? And also like the Canaanite woman, are we willing to be content? Are we satisfied with just the crumbs that fall from the Lord's table? And also the third thing is like the disciples, are we very quick to forget all that God has done for us in our lives? Let's study out further. Let's go to Matthew chapter 16, was one onward. And the title of my lesson this morning is, What do you say that I am? Or who do you say that I am? And in Matthew chapter 16, verse 1, and I'll read this in English. It says, The Pharisees and the Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. Now, who were? Who are these Pharisees and the Sadducees? Now, remember, you got to understand that the Pharisees and the Sadducees did not get along well. They did not like each other because they have separate belief systems. The Pharisees, they believed in angels and demons and heaven and hell and life after death. The Sadducees did not believe in any of these things. Basically, they believed like if you die, once you die, it's end. There is no life after death. Very much like many of the atheists what they believe today. Now, both of them, both this group were affected by Jesus' teachings because Jesus was teaching about eternal life, which was against the Sadducees, and he was claiming to be the Messiah, which went against the Pharisees. Now, because they both had common enemy, they became friends. And so they came together to meet Jesus and ask Jesus for the sign from heaven to support his claims. Now, this is not the first time Jesus has asked this question. In fact, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 to 39, we see the Pharisees already asking these questions to Jesus. And the answer that he gave to the Pharisees and the teachers is similar to the answer that he gives to the Pharisees and Sadducees at this point of time. And in both the times, he's calling these people, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the Sadducees, is calling them a wicked and adulterous generation in both the cases. And in both the cases, he's telling that the only sign that he's going to give is the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now, the interesting thing is what Jesus is telling them, you know, when you look at the sky, you can predict the weather, whether it's going to rain, it's going to be, you know, sunny. It's very easy for you to predict. And yet they see all the miraculous signs that Jesus has been doing, you know, healing the blind, the lame, the deaf, the dumb, the crippled, the leprosy, raising people from the dead. In spite of seeing all the signs, they just refuse to believe in him. So what Jesus was saying is, no matter what I do, you're not going to get convinced. So the only one last sign I'm going to give you is the sign of Jonah. That means Jonah who was in the big belly of big fish for three days and he came back alive. He was talking about his own death, that he is going to die on the cross and going to be raised again after three days. And if you really notice over here that Jesus is again referring back to the Old Testament. And the Jews knew about Jonah and he knew about the fish and everything because it was written in their Torah. And many people I know believe that the, the story of Jonah in the Bible is not true. It is just a myth. And we believe it is true because Jesus mentions it not once but twice in the book of Matthew referring to his own death, burial and resurrection to that of Jonah. And in Matthew 16 verse 4, it says over here that after he tells them this, the Bible says Jesus just left them and went away. You know, he just walks away. He doesn't try to force his teachings, force his opinions. He doesn't try to convince them to see his point of view. All that he does is he tells them the truth and then leaves them. He just leaves them to figure things on their own. Now that is a sign 
of a man who doesn't have to prove to anyone anything. And that is something that Jesus does not only to his op- opponents, people who oppose him, but even to you and me. He is not going to force himself, force his teaching, force us to believe in him and follow him. He is going to just say what he has to say and it is up to you and me to hold on to his teachings and to obey him. And many times I try to convince the other person and try to force them to accept my point of view. And in doing that many times I become so ungodly and hurt my relationship with the person. And we have an incredible example in Jesus where we are, we need to speak the truth in love and then just walk away if people are not willing to listen or accept your point of view. And by doing that you do not damage your relationship with the other person and it gives the opportunity for the other person also to come back to you in case he changes his mind now let's see what did jesus do after he walked away from the pharisees and the sadducees in matthew chapter 16 was 5 to 7 so as they go to the across the lake now the disciples you know they forgot to take bread with them they forgot to carry food and jesus is making a statement now he is making a statement connecting to just now what happened he is making a statement about the pharisees and the sadducees and telling them to be careful about the yeast Now yeast is basically something you use for baking for making bread where you put in the dough you allow it to wait and you you know you allow the the dough to become fluffy and big the the, the disciples were not able to connect over here they thought that Jesus is telling them because they did not bring bread with them he is telling them about to be careful about the pharisees and the sadducees as if the pharisees and sadducees were selling bread or yeast at that point of time let's read further how did jesus explain this was 8 to 12 so we see over here that while jesus was talking about his interaction with the pharisees and sadducees the disciples were thinking about food and jesus rebukes the disciples of their slow understanding and then he was also reminding about the miracle that he just did feeding the 5000 plus and the 4000 plus with so many leftover food So what was the warning that Jesus was giving the disciples? And in verse 12 it says then then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in the bread but against the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So basically what Jesus was warning them was about the false teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now yeast is required in a very small quantity but something that seems so insignificant can have a big impact. and same today many times the false teaching might look very small very insignificant but it can lead us away from the truth and today we don't today see we don't have to worry about the pharisees and the sadducees but we have something more dangerous to worry about it's the world that is trying to influence us little by little and how do the influences is through the social media today that's become such a powerful tool for the world to influence us through the facebook and instagram and twitter and all of these things and youtube is so easily can influence us and there is all kinds of belief system that is floating out on the social media and we are called to be tolerant to all these things and if you are not tolerant to their belief system then we are called intolerant or prejudiced or narrow minded or outdated you know we we cannot fall to the lies of satan and, and not only we see the social media but in the social media we also see many preachers even christian preachers and famous preachers who can mislead us away from the truth you now there is a false teaching that is going around on the internet is all about all you got to do is just believe in jesus and you will be saved just say the sinner's prayer and then you are saved just accept jesus as your personal savior and you are saved you don't have to do anything else you don't need to even repent of your sins you don't have to get baptized for the forgiveness of your sins because people they say that doing that means you are doing something works and the work the complete work of jesus was done on the cross we don't have to do anything to get this salvation if that is true then why even believe in jesus isn't that a work isn't that something you are still called to do why even say the sinner's prayer isn't that works aren't you still doing something why even accept jesus as your personal savior are you still doing something see god's love is unconditional brothers and sisters but his salvation is conditional 
and it is available to all those who believe in him and obey him and obey his teachings. Look in John chapter 8, 31 and 32, the very words of Jesus. And in verse 31 and 32, Jesus is talking to the Jews who believed in him. And he says, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So if, you, if belief in Jesus was enough to be saved, how do we reconcile the words of Jesus in John 8, 31 and 32? Because everyone goes around preaching, all you have to do is believe in Jesus and you will be saved. While here Jesus' words are, if you believe in me, that is not enough. There is a contradiction over here. Are we to listen to Jesus? Or we listen to all these false teachings of the world. Now there are three things that we see in verse 31 that is very clear. The first thing that Jesus is hold. Hold basically means obey. Put into practice. Yes, you are, we are called to do something. The, cro the salvation on the cross is free. Yes, but there is a condition of obedience. Hold what? The second thing it says to hold to my teaching, Jesus is saying. Not the opinions of the world. They do not matter, no matter how popular they are. And when you obey the teachings of Jesus, Jesus says, then you are really my disciple. Then you are really saved. There is no other way we can be saved, brothers and sisters. No matter what the most famous preachers are going to go and tell them, we got to listen to Jesus and his words. It cost Jesus everything on the cross. It has to cost you and me something, at least obedience. And that is what Jesus was warning the disciples about. The religious leaders of his time were able to, were trying to bring in all this false teaching, which we see even today in our lives. You know, whatever you're listening and whatever you're learning, no matter who that person is, always go back to the Bible and check it and confirm it and then obey it. That is what the Bereans did in Acts chapter 17, verse 11. When Paul came to them, and preach to them. In 1711, I'll read in English, it says, Now, Barians, the Barian Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. They did not follow Paul blindly, neither should you and me. Let's go back to Matthew 16, verse 30. Now, Jesus is getting together his disciples. And in verse 13, when he comes, he asks the disciples, who do people say the son of man is? Basically, Jesus is trying to figure out what is the people's opinion about him. Of course, in verse 14, they replied, some say John the Baptist, the others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. The people thought that Jesus was a prophet in the line of Elijah, Jeremiah, John the Baptist, and other prophets. So they did held him with high, in high regards. But in verse 15 and 16, Jesus is asking, now he, they, now he wanted to know what about them. So he's asking them, but what about you? Who do you say I am? He wanted to know the 12 disciples. Who, what do they think about him? Now Simon Peter is the, always the one who will want to speak up first. And his response is, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Peter got it right. What Peter was saying is, Jesus, you are not only the Messiah, but you are God in flesh. Let's read the response of Jesus in Matthew 16, verse 17 and 18. So what, what we see over here is, now this is one of the most misunderstood passage. And many people, they misunderstand this. They think that Jesus is building the church on Peter and choosing him as the leader of the church. Or as many people mistake, this passage is thinking that Peter is the first Pope appointed by Jesus. Actually, what Jesus is saying that the church that he is planning to build is not on Peter, but on Peter's confession that Jesus is Lord and Savior. And we see that also in the book of Acts chapter 2, verse 36 to 37, when Peter talks about that Jesus, that whom you crucified, is both Lord and Messiah. That has always been the message that Jesus, the, Peter preached and all the apostles. Now, many times we misunderstand the word church. We think When we think about church, we think about a building where people come and worship together. But in Greek word, it's called ecclesia. Basically, ecclesia means gathering or assembly of people who have been called out. 
So the church is not made of bricks and stones. The church is made up of people that has been called out of the world to be different. And so you and me are called, we are part of this assembly that are called to be different brothers and sisters. And this assembly is built not on Peter, but on Jesus who died and rose again and is alive today. And something that Jesus says about this assembly, the church, is that he called her, he says, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Now the Greek word Hades basically means place of dead, which is not the correct translation in English. Basically, once we die, we go to the place of dead till we wait for, for the day of resurrection. What Jesus is saying over here is that the power of hell, the power of Satan, the power of devil will not prevail against his people who has been purchased with his precious blood. And so we cannot allow Satan to win in our lives. And how does he do that? You know, he can discourage us. And right now, that is one of the biggest tools that he's using with all kinds of bad news and sad news and difficult things. It is affecting many of us and getting us discouraged. The more sad news you hear, the more bad news we hear, the more we need to go in the presence of God. And how else can he win in our lives? You know, he can make a slave to sin. Are there some sin that we have got entangled in and have not repented or not able to leave? What about bitterness towards people? Struggling, to having bitter feeling towards others and not be able to forgive people who have hurt us. This is the time and many times we feel like, oh, no one is calling me. No one is thinking about me. No one is encouraging me. You know, and we can go into the self-pity. My encouragement is rather waiting for someone to call you and think about you. Why don't you pick up the phone and call somebody? And when you encourage others, you will get encouraged. You know, Jesus promised us that the gates of Hades will not overcome his assembly, his church. We can, we have the confidence that Satan cannot be victorious in our life. And let, let's close out with verse 19 and 20 this morning. And in verse 19, he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. So we see over here that Peter is entrusted by Jesus to be a steward of the gospel of the message. And that is what we saw in Acts chapter 2. You know, when Jesus rose from the dead in Acts chapter 2 afterwards, Peter is the one who gets up and preaches the word of God. And over 3,000 people get baptized. Peter was not the only one who was entrusted with the gospel. Today, even you and me, the followers of Jesus, every disciple of Jesus is also entrusted by Jesus to be the steward of his message to the world around us. So in conclusion, who do you say Jesus is? Is he just a good teacher? Just a prophet? Or is he the Messiah of the world. And what signs are you waiting to be shown in order for you to believe in Jesus and follow him? Are we being like the Pharisees and the Sadducees? We see all the signs and refuse to believe in him. Even when Jesus fulfilled the sign of Jonah, when he died and rose again, the same Pharisees and the Sadducees still refuse to believe in him. Believe in him. I pray that we will not be like the Pharisees and Sadducees. I pray that you and I, every one of us, we can make Jesus, not only a savior, but also the Lord of our life. Jesus cannot be our savior if we are not willing to make him our Lord first. Let's be aware of the false teachings that we hear on the social media from the world. And like Peter said, Jesus, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Amen. Thank you very much. God bless you. Let's have a great week as we continue to glorify God.